Amen. Thank you, Mandy, and choir for leading us, and Rob, and as you've been able to hear already in most every song that we've been able to sing has been talking about the glory of, of God. Uh, the glory of God is what our hearts long for. And as you remember, last week we got into that just a little bit with the last part of the message dealing with the Mount of Transfiguration. And uh, the Lord, as not, it wasn't, I didn't know that last week, but in study time this week, uh, God wanted me to, to spend some more time on that. So we're going to go deeper into uh, Mark chapter 9 this morning. Mark chapter 9. One of the greatest passages of Scripture that we can study together in being able to pray and understand what it looks like when the glory of the Lord comes down. I don't want you to misconstrue or be upset over this picture, but my morning today in the shower was praising the Lord, asking for Him to bring down His glory. That He would bring down His glory. Woke up in the middle of the night thinking about, Lord, today, will you please show us at West Acres, and especially me, as we pray that individually, would you show us today your glory. And when he shows us his glory, things, oh boy, they really change. Uh, our sight changes, our perspective changes, our hearing changes, our walk changes, our motivation changes whenever we can truly say, not, boy, John saw the glory of God, but that you can say, I saw the glory of God in my life. Amen? Amen? Are you ready to, to see the glory of God? I believe you are, and, and we can't manufacture that. Only God can give that, and the way he brings us is through the obedience of his people. It's through our obedience following his word. The title of the message this morning is a, mount, is a mountaintop experience. A mountaintop experience, Mark chapter 9, we're going to begin, begin reading in verse 1. And if you've turned there in your Bibles, then stand with me if you're able. Let's honor God's Word by standing and reading. But I want you to listen carefully because we're going to read just 13 verses of Scripture. And then we're going to ask God to speak those words in our hearts and our lives here today. Mark chapter 9. Let me get over here. I'm over here in Luke chapter 9. That's not going to work. Okay, Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and yes, one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with them. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead." So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? And then verse 13 but I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it was written 
of him. Father, thank you today for giving us the opportunity to read your word. And now even more than reading your word, that you speak your word into our hearts and our lives through the direction of your Holy Spirit that we've welcomed in this room. And I pray, Father, that we've also welcomed you in our hearts to be able to maneuver where you want to maneuver for you to do what you want to do so that the word, what we hear today, the different words that we hear today that will minister to different people in different ways that will make a room for it today by giving our lives completely to you for you to rearrange the furniture in our lives or maybe even get rid of some of the furniture that we have in our lives so that you can put your divine furniture where it needs to be so that we can have the house that you desire to have that will house you that we will be completely open and surrendered and obedient to that relationship with your son Jesus Christ. So help us this morning, Father, and help me as I stand behind your cross and help me to decrease and you increase. And Lord, I pray that all lives in this room and those that watch will be changed forever and ever because we're going to say, Lord, speak to us. And Lord, would you allow us to experience your glory? Let us see your glory in wonderful ways in this room today. Pierce our hearts. Lord, challenge us with your word. And help us to leave this place today renewed, refreshed, inspired, and encouraged because you gave us what we needed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated today. Some some people, and that would be each of us here, and then even folks that are outside these walls today, some people have the idea that the Christian life is just jumping from one mountaintop glorious experience to the other. Now, those that may be immature Christians or maybe they just haven't been Christians long, long, very long, but but many people think about the Christian life as being a life that, that when you're really where you need to be and whenever God is really moving and working in your life, your life, you're on a mountaintop. It's hallelujah, praise the Lord all the time. And people just smiling all the time. People can't wait to tell you how good God is and, and all those things that never seem to have a, have a stumble in their walk or never seem to have a discouraging tone in their voice. It seems like that, that many people believe that the Christian life is to be on the mountaintop all the time. Now, already I said way, way too much there because you already got it from the first statement that no, that's not how it is. I know that's not how it is. I know I had those experiences in my life from time to time, but I also know that there's those experiences, those valley experiences that we have in our lives as well. And that's part of the Christian walk and the Christian example that God desires us to have. Whoever believes those words that I started with, that's false and it's untrue. So just wipe that out of your mind here right now. So today what I want to deal with, I want to deal with reality. I want us to deal with reality, and I want us to just say, Lord, I'm going to give you the next 30, 35 minutes. I want to give totally and completely to you. But I want to deal with reality, the reality of living out your Christian life, whether it's just started or whether it's been going for many, many years. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, you're still going to be living out your life until the Lord calls you home or until he comes to take us home. See, understanding your Christian life is walking a steady pace every single day, yes, with the highs and with the lows. That's the Christian walk. That's the Christian way of life. We, we have those highs, but we have those lows. We, we have great excitement in our life, and we have the great disappointment in our lives. We have that all the time. That's part of the Christian life. We even learned last week of what it's like to take up your cross and follow Jesus Christ. That the Christian life and the Christian walk, Christian living is not always easy. Many times it's so hard, and if we're not totally, totally sold out and surrendered to Him when it gets so hard, many times we'll, we'll put it in reverse. 
We will come to a place where we say, that's as far as I'm going. I'm not stepping another foot forward. And we, we let our life, our Christian walk, become stagnant and stale. And then we become the example of what Christians are really all about when the world sees us. I pray that's not your perspective on this thing called the Christian way of living. This passage that we look at here this morning, the passage of Scripture, is so clear of what it looks like to live the Christian life. It's not a fantasy. The Christian life is reality, and that's what we want to look at here this morning. First of all, if you're taking notes, just jot this down with me. I want you to think in your mind and in your heart these words. Change, change is progressive. Change is progressive. That means change is continuing on and on and on and on every day. Just like change in your body, change in your life. As you get older, there are changes that come about upon you and upon me within my life. But when you became a Christian, you're immediately, we, we th- you're immediately delivered the moment you prayed and asked Christ in your life. You're completely delivered from the guilt of sin. You're, you're, he, he comes and he makes a way where you do not ever have to worry or wonder if sin is going to bring destruction and defeat and complete separation between you and God. You never, ever have to worry about that again. Because of what Christ has done. You never have to worry about the penalty of sin. uh, Where you're going to spend eternity. If you're a true believer, you never have to worry that you're going to spend your time in eternity in a place called hell because you've rejected Christ. No, the Bible says you never ever have to worry about that ever again. And whenever we come to that point in our lives, we have that deliverance, we have that power, the strength that God places within us, and sometimes it wavers and goes and moves out of our lives, and we wonder what in the world has happened. But one of the things when we become a believer and a follower of Christ, we don't always, just like when I became saved, I was saved, immediately saved. Now, I grow in that, but I was immediately saved. But bad habits that we have before we were saved... Change comes progressively. Change comes. We, 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 we have to work through those things in our walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what's scary sometimes because some folks come and give their life to Christ. And they say and know and believe they're a child of the king. But yet they're still in that habit over and over. And what happens instead of that habit beginning to be removed from your life because of your relationship with God because it's still there. We, we think there's something wrong. Something's not right. But it's progressive. Change is progressive. Strongholds that come in our lives, they still come in our lives. You see, most of the things in our lives that need to change is progressive. We all are works in progress that's, that does me good to know that whenever I mess up and whenever I, I say things and do things and I'm thinking, why in the world, why in the world, I, I'm always able to be reminded I'm a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. Did you know that? Carol, did you know that you're a work in progress? Did you know that? Everybody, Tommy, work in progress. Every pastor is a work in progress. Every, every minister, every person, every believer is a work in progress. Mark 9 verse 2 says this. It says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Don't miss this. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Now, They had not arrived. Peter, James, and John. Think about the key disciples. Peter, James, and John. This would be the core group. If if there were three out of of all the twelve, the three that would be called upon as the core of the core of the disciples, it would be Peter, James, and John. 
But they had not arrived. They were in the process of learning. Peter, James, and John had a hunger for God. They had a hunger for God and believed God was in the process of feeding their hunger. And even some this morning, you have come because you're expecting a blessing. Did you, did you hear that? that there, there are some people here this morning who've walked in these doors and you're expecting a blessing. And if you came this morning expecting a blessing, you're going to get a blessing. If you came this morning not expecting a blessing, guess what? You're not going to get a blessing. God provides for us when we come before Him with expectancy. And we're here, a work in progress, needing a word from God. Moving along in this Christian life, progressing, moving forward. But you and I need, must be here today, expecting God to do great things. Expecting. The Bible says, they that hunger and thirst for righteousness will do what? They will be filled They are hungering and seeking righteousness. And if you're here today hungry and seeking righteousness, you are about to be filled. You're about to experience the movement and the power and the earth-shaking power of Almighty God. The Bible tells us this, dear church. He says, draw near to me. And what? I'll draw near to you. So if your heart is is an expecting heart and you're here today saying, Lord, I want to draw near to you. And if you draw near to him out of obedience, desiring to hear from him, you don't have to wonder if you're going to hear from him. You're not going to have to wonder where he is, how far away he is. If you draw near to him, listen to this. He says, I'm going to draw near to you. That is fascinating to me that we can come together here today, you and I, as I refer to myself, and I hope you're okay if I refer to you. I've referred to you this in the past, and no one has gotten offended, or you haven't told me. But we're all a bunch of misfits. A bunch of misfits. And God desires to draw near to us. He he desires to have that relationship, just like we are. Just like we are, He's chosen to come and to be who He promised in Scripture that He will be for us. So let me ask you this morning as I've asked myself already, how blessed do you want to be today? How blessed do you want to be today? How much do you want to know today? How much of God do you want to know today? How much of a blessing do you want to leave here with today? How much of Christ do you want to experience in this house today? Well, it's up to you. And it's up to me. It's all up to us. The answer to all those questions It's up to us here this morning. God says, I will bless you. God says, I will teach you. God says, I will use you. But the question is, do you want to be blessed? Do you want to learn? And do you want to be used? That's the bottom line. It's not, God, are you able? God, will you provide? Will you use me? Will you bless me? Will you uphold me? Will you empower me? But it's how Do we want God to do that? Do we want God to do what God says He'll do? And when He doesn't do it, when He says He'll do it, it's not because God's not able and willing and desiring to do it. It's we've come into the place of God, the house of God, without any desire for God to do in our lives what we need the most. It's probably a picture of the church everywhere in the world we live. In church... Sitting, singing, praising, reading, standing, praying, all of those things. But how much of God do we really want to show up? How much of the blessing of God do we really want? Change is progressive. There's no better illustration on how, to t- how that change takes place that can be found in the entire Bible other than in Christ's transfiguration. 
Christ's transfiguration, one of the most important events in the life of Jesus is right here in Scripture, right here in Mark chapter 9. It's one of the greatest experiences for him, and when it becomes that great an experience for him, it becomes that great experience for each of us to be able to listen and to learn and to be challenged from the Word of God. He says to these men, he says, you will not taste death until you see the glory of God. You're not going to die until you see the glory of God. And then guess what happens? He shows them the glory of God. He didn't say you're not going to taste death until you see the glory of God. Good luck being able to see the glory of God. No, they wanted to see the glory of God. They were walking with God. They were trusting Him along the way. Now they hear what the words of the Lord have said and they're hungry for the glory of God. And because He says, you'll not taste death till you see the glory of God, and they were able to see the glory of God right before their eyes. What happens on the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus was walking in a human body. On the Mount of Transfiguration, this is not a fairy tale. This is not a figment of our imagination. This literally took place on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was walking in a human body. Concealed, he concealed his majesty in a body of flesh, in a body of blood. And he peels back his humanity to expose the majesty and glory of God. He says, I'm not just a man. He says, I'm a God man. I'm not just a man, I'm a God man. And I'm going to let you see God, the God who dwells in me in this human body. I'm going to reveal it to you and your life will never be the same. He even tells them, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody about what you've experienced whenever you go back to reality. Why did he say that? Boy, that's like, so, that's like for me having a grandchild and, and the Lord saying, don't tell anybody that you're a granddaddy. You know, one of the reasons that I think that he said, and I know there's a lot of different perspectives and thoughts out there why he said this, I believe this is one of the main reasons, I believe it was this. Even if they tried to explain the glory of God after they had been in the presence of God, it would have all fallen short because there's no words in the vocabulary of an individual to explain what it's like to experience the glory of God. But we can experience it, just like they did. So on the mountain, well, let me look at a scripture here. Think about Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says this, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his Son, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So on the mountain, the Lord exposes them to His majesty, exposes him to them to His glory, and the word He uses for this event in the life of Jesus is the word transfigured. Mark 9, verse 2, the last part, it says, He was transfigured before them. That simply means he was transfigured right before their eyes. Right then and there. Now, we have a word in our English language that comes from the word of trans transfigured and it's the word metamorphosis and we're very familiar with that. Metamorphosis is a change on the outside that comes from the inside. A caterpillar, if you have seen this happen so often, a beautiful illustration in the word of God. A caterpillar forms a cocoon around itself and then there comes a day when coming out of that old ugly, that old ugly plain cocoon is this beautiful butterfly of all colors. It is a metamorphosis. It's a change. It's a progressive change. It's a progressive change. The Bible says Jesus was transfigured. What's inside of Him 
came outside for Peter, James, and John to see. Romans 12 verse 2 says, And do not, notice this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be, circle, underline, transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here we have the same word. The same word right here, transformed. Progressingly, progressing. A mind that's progressing, a mind that's being renewed. You see, your mind is messed up and all of our minds are messed up from time to time. And they're messed up because of Satan and because of sin. And see, your mind, you renew your mind through and by the Word of God, he says. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, familiar passage, it says, But we all with unveiled face, unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being, here's that word again, transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The word transformed. When I look in the mirror, the Word of God, it shows me what I really am. The Word of God shows me what I really am. The mirror doesn't lie to you. The mirror will never lie to you. A photographer can take a picture of you and he can touch it up. I, I tell you one of the things that's amazing to me is uh, some of you folks, and, and this is not a bad thing, this is not a jab, it's just amazing of people that have the glamour shots. And I'll see a glamour shot of someone, and I'll think, who in the world is that? <laughs> Do I know them? And it's someone maybe that I do life with. I see, a photographer can go, and boy, he can make you look really, really good. He can, he can change those things, those blemishes and those wrinkles. He can take them all away. Wouldn't it be great to have a photographer to come along and meet with you one day and just come and do you up? Now, I know that happens today. Uh, it's called some types of surgery that does the same thing. But I, I'm not talking about doing that. But wouldn't it be great if that, if that were to, to happen? See, you look like the mirror places before you and there's no lying in front of you so you look in the mirror in the morning why you look in the mirror to see what adjustments need to be made before you go out into the world <laughs> for some there's a little adjusting well you finish that statement transformed it says Transformed, change on the outside that only comes from within. See, this is how change takes place. You as a believer realizing, here it is, here's where progression in your life continues to progress into your life changing if you have this in your heart. These words, I haven't arrived. I'm not there yet. No matter, no matter what somebody tells me. I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived yet. See, transforming you into the glory of God. Change is progressive and there should be some change taking place in every believer's life. Every single day, every one of us in here, you, we ought to be able to be asked from one day to the next day, what, what change is going on in your life? And there should be an answer to that. It shouldn't be, well, I don't know of anything. I haven't even noticed anything. But there should be obvious change each and every day, each and every week, each and every month as we're changing to be more like the Lord. Number two, notice this with me. Heaven is a real place. Heaven is a real place. Verse four says, And Elijah appeared to them with Moses... And they were talking with Jesus. Now you, you hear who I said was talking to Jesus? Old Testament Elijah and Old Testament Moses. They're talking to Jesus. 
That is amazing to me. Not to the place that's hard to believe, but amazing to me that we get in on it here in the Scripture. Most people see people talking and they want to know what they're talking about. What are you talking about? I didn't quite get that last part. What are you, what are you saying? The Gospel of Luke tells us what they're talking about. The Gospel of Luke makes it very clear what they're talking about. They're talking. I'm talking about Moses who stood by the Red Sea, who held up the rod, and the sea opened up, and the people walked to the other side, yes, and I believe it, on dry land. I'm talking about Elijah who was on Mount Carmel and as he prayed and he prayed with passion and power and the heavens opened up and God sent down fire and consumed the sacrifice and God sent a mighty, great, life-changing revival he brought. They appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. In the Gospel of Luke it says they were talking about his death. Mark doesn't tell us that, but, but Luke tells us. He gives a little more information many times, but he said that they were, they were talking about his death. Why were they talking about his death? It's very clear, and especially if we look in the book of Luke, but Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets are fulfillment of the Jesus Christ. It's fulfilled in none other than Jesus alone. You see, everything in the Word points to Jesus. Everything. Wow. Everything points to Jesus Christ. They're talking to Jesus about death, but they teach us something about heaven. See, living the consistent Christian life, one of the things that gives us hope is to remember this is not all there is. Oh, if you need hope today, and maybe you're here today and you're thinking this is just it and Monday's starting up again, it's going to be the same old, same old all the time. I want to tell you this is not all there is. One of the things, one of the things that give us hope is to remember this is not all there is. We're not just living for here and now. See, Moses died of natural causes matter of fact the bible teaches us we don't know where but the bible teaches us that god himself buried moses he died of old age he was a mighty servant of god and god buried him himself Now, Elijah, on the other hand, was raptured, the Bible says, carried out within a chariot of fire. They represent the only two ways that you're going to leave this world. For some Christians, it will be a physical death. My soul and my spirit leaving my body and going to be with the Lord. And and i got to throw this in because I just want to clear up some folks' doctrine here today. And I'm not clearing it up because I have a seminary degree. I'm just clearing it up because it just... I just want to clear it up. When you die, or anybody that's died before you that was a believer, those that have died before you that are with Jesus, you, when you die, you'll be with Jesus. You are not, you never will be an angel in heaven. I hear it all the time whenever I'm talking to loved ones and that have lost loved ones. And I don't usually say anything because it's not the right time to say it. So I just say it here to everybody. <laughs> but someone will say that well, their mom or their dad or their friend or their loved one has passed away. And they'll say, I know, I know God made them an angel. And I'll know they're in heaven as an angel. They're an angel in heaven. I'm thinking, no, they're not. You don't, you don't want them to be an angel. An angel, that's great, and that's wonderful. But it's better being a child of God whenever we leave this place here on earth and go to be with the Lord. We're going to be able to walk with Him and talk with Him and hold Him and touch Him and and put our tears of thankfulness on His feet. Oh, there's nothing like that. But you're not going to be an angel. Moses here represents those who experience physical death. Elijah pictures those who experience the rapture. Now that's the generation I want to be a part of. 
<laughs> and I would have to say you would agree with that, amen. Wouldn't you like to be the rapture church today that's going to be raptured out of here? We're all going to go together. We will not face death, but we'll leave here and stand on this old corrupt land and we will one day be there and stand on holy ground in the presence of Almighty God. Now, it could happen this morning. It, it could. Boy, how would it be? I've said that for 33 years. I've been saying that. But one of these days, it's going to happen. And how I would love for it to happen right here in this room, this place, with my family, to experience the glory of the Lord. What a beautiful picture. Well, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, listen to this word, his word. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive at the moment are going to be caught up and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord for a few hours if we're good enough. Well, no, it says we will be with the Lord forevermore. That's a forevermore. As a child of God, you may be on a mountain, you may be in a valley, you may be in the drudgery of living every single day of life, looking at the same man, looking at the same woman, looking at the same children, looking at the same breakfast, looking at the same job, looking at the same routine, looking at the same clothes, driving the same car, living in the same house, coming to the same church, same old, same old, all the time, same old. But listen, what brings life to the same, the Bible says, you will never die. You're going to heaven. And the Bible says it could be today. The scripture says the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout and reach his hand down and we will forever be with the Lord. And then whenever I know that, I say this, just bring on the same old. Bring it on because Jesus is coming and I'm going to be there and you're going to be there and He's going to reach down His hand and we're going to go to be with Him in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and we're going to leave all of this stuff behind. And guess what? You will not need a preacher in heaven. I'm just going to, we're just going to walk with the Lord in heaven and praise the Lord in heaven. Do a little fishing on the side. Maybe do a little flower picking on the side. It's going to be a wonderful day when the child of God gets to go to be with the Lord Jesus. And that's all of us in this room if we know the Lord so He should encourage us and empower us and motivate us here today. This tells me when we go to heaven we will retain our names. So if you do not like your name, you still have time to change it. <laughs> now, I don't know about that. I, I, I say that. I don't know that if it's too late maybe to change names. You've, your mom and dad gave you the name. So maybe that's what God gave them to name you. That's what it's going to be. But I know people change names. But whatever, you're going to have a name it's not going to be a brand new name. I mean, it's not going to be, you're not going to be totally somewhere that someone else. The Bible tells us that you're going to go to heaven and you're going to retain your name. You will be recognized by loved ones. You're going to be recognized by loved ones. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to be recognized and you're going to recognize. Everybody awake in here? The Lord, the Bible says, is going to descend from heaven with a shout and reaches out His hand and we will forever be with the Lord. We will be with the Lord. It will be a glorious place, a place of fellowship and we will never ever have to say goodbye again. On my dad's tombstone, I shared, we just recently got that up in the cemetery in my hometown and a lot of people write a lot of things on the cemeteries or on the stones, but there are two words on my dad's cemetery or <laughs> his stone, okay? Now, these are the words it's see ya. Because if you knew my dad, you never heard him. If you talked to him on the phone, you, he never said goodbye. And if you did say goodbye, if he knew you well enough, he'd say, no, see ya. 
See ya. See, see, that's what we have before us here. There's no more goodbyes. It is simply, we'll see ya. Okay. Number three. Silence. And this, this one, this, this is a whole sermon right here by itself. But I'm not going to preach it. It won't be that way. But the number three is this. Silence is golden. Silence is golden. Did you ever walk away from a conversation and say, why did I say that? What was I thinking? Anybody ever done that? Let me see your, my hands up. Okay. Why did I say that? What was I thinking? Where did that come from? Notice here, the Lord is transfigured. Elijah and Moses show up and Peter feels like he has to say something. Verse 5, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why? Why? Why would you want to do that? Verse 6, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Here's some wisdom I want to give to you that I've gained over my life through mistakes. But it's some good wisdom. Some good wisdom. And hold on to it. This will will help you. When you don't know what to say, listen, when you, are you all listening? When you don't know what to say, don't say anything. That is some of the best advice that I can give to you that I've learned and probably you've learned as well. When you don't know what to say, don't say anything. I've never in my life regretted being with families through hard times and struggles. I've never regretted keeping my mouth shut. I never have. Because most of the time what you say may not even be heard but your presence there will be remembered for a lifetime it'll be remembered for a lifetime Jesus is above everybody including Moses and Elijah uh, let's build three tabernacles. Well, Jesus we'll build you one and then we'll put right beside you Elijah and then we'll put Moses right beside you Peter what are you thinking Peter, why don't you just just be quiet? Have you not learned up until this point to be quiet? You have to get in the Word. And you have to listen. Verse 7 and 8, And a cloud came and overshadowed them. Right after, right after that statement, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, to remind Peter, James, and John, This is my beloved Son. Stop Talking and listen to him. This is my beloved son. He says, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one but only Jesus with them. The voice of God and the Son of God. Final point this morning. The gospel is simple. The gospel is simple. If you're not careful, you'll get off into some strange fantasy of someone that only complicates the gospel. There are people everywhere that want to complicate the gospel. They add to the word by saying there's something beyond Jesus. Jesus is good. Jesus is great. But there's something beyond Jesus. They complicate the gospel. Listen, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. We're complete in Him and there's nothing beyond Christ but confusion. Nothing. Verse 9. Now as they came down from the mountain, He commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning, they heard him say, until the Son of Man is risen from the dead, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. What it meant. They're not going to live up there 
in three tabernacles. That's, that's Jesus already shot that down. That's not going to happen. God put his foot down. Peter, James, and John, what does the rising, they said, what does the rising of the dead mean? They say, we don't know. What does it mean? And it simply means he's going to die and he's going to raise from the dead. Don't make it more difficult. And that's how Scripture is so often. We, it, it's very plain and clear, clear that he went to the cross and he died. Why he went to the cross and he died? And on the third day, he came back to life. He walked with the disciples. He, he ascended back to be with his father. Well, there's got to be something else to that. There's got to be something else that he went here a while, went there a while, stayed here a little longer, so got away from this, this place a little quicker than before. No, he did what the Bible says he did. Don't complicate the gospel. The gospel is simple. Did you ever notice Jesus and his teachings, how he repeated over and over his truths? And most of the time, we, didn't, we don't get it the first time. That's why we could continue. I could preach through the entire Word of God, the entire Bible, and we'll go back and do it again and again and again and again because we do not get it. I do not get it the first time, the second time, sometimes the third time, and even beyond. See, if Satan is allowed, he will talk us out of the truth that God has given us. And that's what we battle every single day. The, the devil's unhappy that you're here. The devil's unhappy that you're attentive. The devil's unhappy that you're not on your phone texting or sending emails. The devil is upset that you are actually giving God your time and attention because now he's going to have to work over time whenever you leave here because you're leaving here inspired by the Word of God because you have listened and you've taken the Word of God God in your heart and he's going to be waiting on you to talk you out of the truth that you've heard today to talk you out of the truth that's been given to us through the inspiration of the word of God see other times we just have such crowded lives we have so much going on that we don't engage our brains with the word of God and I don't have time. I've got to get to this place. I've got to go to this place. I've got to get my kids here. I've got to get my kids there. I've got all this going on. I've got to get to the store. I've got to get shopping. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to do all these things. And in the midst of all those things, even a good godly person that loves God, fears God, lives for God, finds themselves the Word of God not being priority and being their guide and direction within their lives. We don't engage our brains with the Word of God. And Jesus is the only way, I conclude. He's the only way. You never arrive as a Christian disciple in this life. Your failure, your failures do not have to be final. They do not have to be final today. Many times past failures are defining us. We, we hold on to past failures. I remember what I did last week. I remember what I did last month. I remember what I did last year. I remember, and we hold on to those things, and we can't move forward because the past is defeating us. And Christ went to the cross, and he defeated the past. He defeated the present. And he defeated the future so that we, in the midst of our same old, same old, we can know that Jesus Christ is coming again. That he's coming Oh, how I wish that he would come to West Acres first. <laughs> I know he's not going to do that. I haven't found that in Scripture, that he's going to come here first and then take care of the rest of the people afterwards. But he's coming. It'll be like we were the first, because when he comes, it'll be like the only church that sees him, the only people that see him, and everybody else in this world that are believers and followers of him. It'll be like he's the looking at them, coming for them, just for them. It's going to happen one of these days. Experience on the mountaintop. What an experience that was. They saw the glory of God. Have you been able to feel, sense, and experience the glory of God even here today through the preaching of His Word and through the eagerness to desire to hear from Him. I pray you have.